tarde a todos. Uh, and I'm immediately going to speak in English because we don't have interpreters. So, um, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation to be here today. Um, this idea uh, was uh, it's a very good idea to have interchange and dialogue. We are going to put questions to you and you are going to put questions to us. And uh, the reason, uh, I mean, I would love to, to tell you that this uh, idea was mine, but unfortunately it was not. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a proposal, a specific proposal uh, that was suggested to us by Andrea Ria. Um, that's him that wanted to have this dialogue with the Portuguese young people. Uh, people that uh, are uh, less than 35 years old or around it, and, uh, and that are uh, stakeholders, and uh, doesn't matter if you are 36. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, okay, it's a new generation. It's uh, young professionals, and, um, and uh, I think it's, it's really, uh, when, when he suggested it, I, I, I thought, well, what a marvelous thing, because in fact we could have done it before, but we didn't. And, um, well, myself, uh, probably, I'm not sure if you know who I am, but um, I'm uh, a member of the board of Bank of Portugal, and I have uh, the, the portfolio of uh, banking supervision, among other, other issues. But uh, this, is, this is the professional reason why I, I am uh, I mean, in permanent contact with uh, Andrea Ria, and I'm very, very happy to welcome here in Portugal. Uh, I'm starting to suspect that he likes us. <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, in, after after he he was, I mean, he took the the job of um, he, he was for eight years in EBA, as you know, and he was the chairperson of EBA, uh, and he did all the building up of EBA from scratch. And uh, now, recently, came uh, to substitute Daniel Nui uh, in as uh, the chair of the supervisory board. So that's where the, the systemic banks, the most important banks, are directly supervised. Uh, and uh, and I sit around the table uh, where is the chairperson. Um, but uh, for us, I mean, people from other generations, it is really uh, very difficult sometimes to understand how everything functions, how you have uh, this kind, what is exactly the kind of competencies that we have, uh, how we function, how we organize ourselves, uh, what we request from banks, what lessons we learned from the past crisis, um, and probably for you, uh, I don't know, that's what we want to find out, uh, whether it is absolutely straightforward because uh, that's the new reality, that's the new normal, that's what you are used to, or if otherwise you have questions, you have uh, um, suggestions that you want to make, uh, and uh, that's the reason why, uh, I mean, we are here. So uh, my purpose was not to make a speech, was to say that it's really great that you accepted to come that we want to, to listen to your questions, that uh, I'll, from my on my behalf I, I will try to answer, but uh, there may be questions that I, I don't know the answer. That's a possibility too. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, even those ones, it will be, there will be someone more experienced than, than I am and more responsible than I am, and then I, I give him the, <laughs> the floor so that he answers. But uh, Andrea, thank you very much. Um, we had a couple of weeks ago the meeting of the supervisory board here in Lisbon. It was really a big event. Uh, and uh, and it, I, I thanked him that, then and I thank him now. And this is the reason why I say that probably he likes us. Because uh, it was, uh, I mean, if you do it twice. So he has chosen to come here and to have uh, this, uh, this occasion to, to have a full program today and tomorrow. Uh, with, uh, with, with us, uh, the, the ones that uh, operate here in Portugal, be it Portuguese or foreigners, doesn't matter. It matters that we are located here, that's the responsibility that we have for financial stability here in Portugal, and that uh, all of us, we have got to do our best. So the floor is yours, and thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Elisa. Thanks for uh, organizing this event and, uh, uh, and all our todos. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm very happy to see so many, so many young people here, and I'm very glad that you helped, helped us organizing this event. Um, First of all, this is uh, not for me to deliver speeches, more to get questions and to listen. I mean, that's the main, uh, the main purpose. But let me say a few words before, before we start. Um, um, last Saturday, I, I was at the wedding of my daughter, who was probably in the, in the age range of many people here around, uh, around the, 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 the room. And uh, um, she studied international development, so there was a lot of people coming from all around the world, emerging countries, uh, US, uh, Southeast Asia, and a lot of European countries. And talking with them, you know, I mean, it was clear that uh, your generation has been particularly uh, hit by, by, by the crisis, by what happened in the last, uh, in the last, uh, in the last years. I mean, all of them uh, have partners sometimes living in other countries, finding jobs in other places, commuting, uh, some of them not having even, uh, you know, the, the, the time and possibility to see their children growing every day. And the same happens actually, actually for many staff working with me, for many young Europeans working with me at the, at the ECB. And I think that for people like you, who have been working in finance, who have studied maybe economics or law, and uh, were trying to, to, to start a, a career in finance exactly at the time when the crisis struck, I think it must have been uh, really, uh, really difficult. And uh, uh, the devastation left by the crisis uh, has also led to a, a, an increase in the, in the popular rage that we see in day-to-day in -day life with dissatisfaction with the political elites, but also with challenges to the European project to the European Union and uh, and uh, uh and I think it is something on which we need to, to reflect. The banking sector was at the epicenter of this earthquake. And uh, we have done a lot to, uh, to fix the problems, uh, regulatory reforms, uh, uh, let's say establishment of European supervision, strengthening of a number of uh, safeguards within the banking sector, in the, in the official sector. Uh, but the, the first point I want to raise is that eventually, I think that the, uh, the, the key point, the key change is culture. No? It's really a change in, in, in the way in which people working in the industry uh, behave themselves, think about their role, and uh, perceive their responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis not only, let's say, the shareholders uh, or the authorities, uh, but also towards the general, uh, the general public and the society at, uh, at large. And these are things that you cannot legislate. I mean, these are things that cannot be fixed with, uh, with rules. No? These are things that need to be uh, fixed in other, in other ways and need to be really uh, nourished within the banking sector itself. And uh, uh, sometimes when you talk about these issues of culture, you hear a lot about tone from the top. No? So, uh, and also, from the supervisors generally, you try to go to the top management and say, you know, you need to change the culture. But eventually, the culture changes when you go really to the middle management. I see that many of you are also head of departments, and but also from, I would say, from the voice and, and involvement of, of people from the bottom, I would say, from the experts, from people starting a career in banking, making sure that they have voice, that they can speak up, that they can see if they see something going in the, in the wrong direction. So culture is an important thing, and feeling the responsibility for the culture, I think, is, is an important uh, is an important issue. Now, um, in reaction to the, to the crisis, one of the major changes has been, of course, to set up uh, European supervision, to centralize functions for, uh, for supervision at the European level. And this is indeed also, as Elisa knows very well, a big uh, cultural challenge in a sense, because we were uh, working together, cooperating since a long while, but the supervisory cultures, traditions were very different. And this means that uh, this has been a big change, a big change for everybody, for the banking industry, for the national competent authorities, and also for the people who have had this hot potato, let's say, uh, to deal with in Frankfurt. 
Um, this is, uh, is, is a, so having something that works in terms of the interconnection with the national authorities is, uh, is essential, and that's why I, uh, again, uh, I, I'm very glad to come to each and every uh, capital, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I must say, indeed, Lisbon is the only one in which I've been twice already since, uh, since I started my, my job at the ECB in January. Um, but it's also a challenge in terms of really having the, the, uh, the, the banks understanding what we do, what we are, what we want, and uh, what are our new processes. And, uh, and it is a big, sometimes also meeting, you know, uh, top manager of banks, you, you realize that also them sometimes uh, don't really understand uh, what we do and uh, why, let's say, the, the requirements are, 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 are what they are, and they, don't, they, they look at the comparison, and there is still a little bit of uh, displacement in the market. So I think it's an important uh, task for me to try to make sure that there is a clear understanding at all levels of the banking industry of what we are, what we do, and trying to explain, be predictable, be transparent, and, uh, and be invisible. So that's also part of this engagement that I, I, I want to have here with you today. And finally, the last thing I want to say is that uh, the, the the European banking sector has changed a lot. Let's say the first part has been mainly also driven by the regulatory reforms, by European supervision, to deal with the legacy of the crisis, no? raise capital levels, uh, clean the balance sheets, uh, increase the liquidity buffers, so be more resilient. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of deleveraging. This deleveraging has been also associated to a large extent to repatriation of business, refocusing on domestic business, and uh, this meant that to some extent we have a less integrated market today than we had before the crisis, which is an issue for us that uh, believe in, in, in the single market in the European, in the European project. Uh, but more generally, there are structural challenges. And there is also, uh, and I think that this will be, uh, besides the completion of the process, which we have started and, and brought to a, a significant uh, point in terms of maturity of post-crisis adjustment, uh, I think that the structural challenges in terms of consolidation, integration of the market, but also dealing with the new uh, competition coming from uh, uh, new players, from fintech companies, digitalization of banking. I mean, these are all, uh, let's say, challenges that we rank high in the priorities that we will face uh, going forward. And of course, digitalization is something on which uh, uh, which will be probably one of the uh, of the top uh, priorities, also from the point of view of the development of the industry in the coming years, and uh, and uh, something for which you will probably be very much uh, very much involved going forward. Uh, I have always difficulties to, to you know, I, I don't think I ever saw my daughter going to a branch of a bank. I mean, she's only, <laughs> she's only doing it when, when uh, anyway. So I think that this, this is something that will, uh, will, change, uh, will change quite a lot the way in which banking is, uh, is, uh, is done uh, around. I would also say that uh, uh, speaking to young people for me is important because there is one point which I think has not been really followed up a lot after the crisis, which is the fact that the banking industry was very much focused on, uh, on the short term, you know, on short term profits, on short term assessment of risks. And then when the hit came, you know, uh, everybody realized that they didn't actually, there wasn't enough uh, depth in the ability to look forward, to have a longer perspective on uh, what would happen after, after a while w with the risks that were being taken. And, uh, and I think this uh, short-sightedness has not yet been really, uh, really addressed. And uh, uh, again, uh, if you look forward to the, the, the banking sector that you will have in 10, 15 years, which will be the banking sector you will build uh, from, from your, from your uh, progression in career, uh, is, uh, is, is a banking sector that will need, uh, let's say, attention to new issues. I mentioned digitalization, but for, of course also the issue of uh, uh, environmental transition, green finance and the like are also other important topics. So it's, it is important. and. Uh, when, when talking to the younger generation,
situations that this uh, longer term perspective is very much present in what you do uh, every day. I know that you will be probably under pressure for targets, achieving uh, objectives uh, in a short period of time, but I mean, it's also important to keep this long term perspective. Uh, and we as supervisors need also to, to see how to you know, put the right incentives for that as well. So I'm, I, that's all I wanted to say as a way of introduction, but I look forward very much to your question and to a, an interactive dialogue with you today. Thank you very much for being here, so numerous. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, the well, yeah. Ana Rita will be in charge. Uh, I don't know how, how well you know her. You may think that she comes from a TV channel. <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, she's always under pressure to move to the present profession that she has uh, to a new, a new challenges. Uh, of course, she'll be uh, 36 next, year, next month. <laughs> I wish. I wish. No. She's, uh, Ana Rita, she's in charge here in the in the Bank of Portugal of the big of the big institutions. Uh, so those institutions that are under the direct supervision of the um, of the ECB and supervisory board, uh, and she works di directly with the Luis Costa Ferreira, who is the head of supervision, sitting there, uh, hiding there, because <laughs> 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 who is in charge of everything. So uh, Ana Rita, you yes. have got to. Yes, to stimulate I'll the discussion, so go ahead. Yes, I mean, first of all, I think it's it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I think I share this with the audience, uh, with uh, with Mr. Enria and, and with Elisa, <laughs> and uh, having the opportunity to basically liaise with the supervisor, the one that indirectly or directly uh, impacts your daily work, um, and also an opportunity for you to share uh, the main challenges and things that you would like really to share uh, that affects your your day-to-day -day work um, so I will open the floor I will start with a question I mean in order to to open the floor which is to uh, Mr. Enria um, what were the main challenges that you encountered that you face uh, when you as assumed this very challenging position in the banking industry because I mean you have to face with so many stakeholders um, what were the main challenges? In my new job, the one I yes, have now. No. <laughs> well, I mean, the first one was the clutter in my inbox, I would say. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because the, I can tell you, we, we had last year 2,000 decisions, a process, just short of 2,000 decisions. So the decision making process is, uh, is really, really very demanding and overwhelming, actually. So uh, I think the, the, the most important uh, challenge is to have, I mean, I, I must say the decision making process is very robust because it involves the national authorities. Um, it has, uh, of course, the dialogue with the banks. So when things come to the uh, final stage, so to my table, let's say the products are very robust. I mean, the, the, the system is ultra safe, uh, very strong. Uh, but still, you know, you have responsibilities. Still. You have to understand everything, yeah, go yeah. through it, and uh, it is quite a lot. So that's, I think, is uh, is the main, uh, the main, uh, the main responsibility. The other big responsibility for me is. Uh, uh, well, the governance of the SSM, I mean, the supervisory yeah. board, where mm -hmm. these seats, I mean, we need to have, to ensure a proper discussion, you know, building a, a good uh, European, uh, you know, uh, atmosphere, yeah. atmosphere mm -hmm. uh, and uh, willingness to work together and to have a, a genuine uh, common perspective, perspective on the on the common European interest. And that's, uh, that's also a challenge to ensure, you know, a, a balanced, uh, a balanced the way in which uh, uh, of working for the for the authority. That's, okay. Uh, Thank these you are very the much. Now we open the floor for the audience. I, w I would I would ask if um, I mean the ones that have questions, state out your name, bank, and area of the bank where you work. The first. Do we see any candidates here? Front. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joana Placid. I'm from Milani BCP Risk Office. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you this opportunity of sharing our ideas, our point of views, and most of all, our, our experiences. So the point that I would like to raise for question and for discussion is the following. 
Ah, ok. <laughs> so that everybody sees you. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Okay. The point I would like to raise for discussion is the following. Uh, nowadays, uh, institutions following an IRB approach are obliged to follow strict and specific uh, rules in the development of their risk models. And um, how it is ensure this balance between the need of harmonization among uh, the players, assuring a, a level playing field across the market, and the, the, the idiosyncrasies of each, of each uh, institution. Uh, in practice, and for instance, um, how should an institution uh, um, use their their prudential risk metrics uh, in use tests uh, when we have such differences, such differences in some assumptions? Uh, we know that some assumptions or requirements in a prudential perspective are different from uh, internal management models. So, how can we achieve uh, this this balance? Uh, for us, sometimes it, it is a challenge, and I'd like to, to open this discussion. Thank you. Thank it's you. a very good question, but it's the level playing field of the. <laughs> Yeah. So, so it's your perspective, I think, not mine. Well, let me let me let me be clear here. Uh, when when the I, I I've been a strong supporter of the use of internal models in uh, in regulation. Uh, I started with some uh, doubts, I must say, in the in the early 2000s when the Basel debates were were ongoing. But eventually I thought that it was a, a good idea exactly for the reason you mentioned, for the use test. So because it's, uh, for the supervisor, it's an important entry point in the way in which banks themselves view, measure, and manage risks. No? So uh, having a, if you want to have really a risk-based supervision, you need to understand how the banks uh, measure the risks. And uh, allowing the use of internal models is, is uh, a, an important uh, uh, tool to do exactly that. When the crisis started, though, it was clear that uh, nobody started trusting the models anymore. So the, the investors, analysts, lost completely any, any uh, confidence in the measurement of risks and in the capital, the capital ratios that the banks were publishing because they thought that they were not reliable. They saw banks that were, you know, with a risk with yeah. assets, uh, uh, with a capital ratio of uh, 18, 20 percent going bust one day from the mm -hmm. other. And then they said, well, uh, so this is, this is uh, something that cannot be, cannot, be, cannot be trusted. And I remember that there was a lot of rating agencies uh, analysts that started publishing their own estimates, of course, much less risk sensitive, of, uh, of the capital position of the bank. So at that moment, also in the, in the, in the supervisory debates, there was a, a strong push to really take internal models and throw them in the bin. So to, to move totally to a, a, a leverage ratio style uh, approach. And it was not, uh, you know, uh, emerging markets. So it was the US in particular that was very, very focused on that. I mean, the US, uh, had a ch which, I mean, they had been the, the, the most uh, uh, vocal promoters of the use of internal models, especially of credit risk internal models in the, towards the end of the 90s, early 2000s. And they uh, were having second thoughts, and they started moving to a setting in which the, the supervisor itself, the Fed, was measuring risks more in a top-down way with their own models. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the SCAP, the first stress test that the Fed made, was done entirely by the Fed. It, it was a black box. Nobody knew what was, uh, uh, what was the, the, the way that the Fed used to, 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 to measure risk. And to some extent, is, this is still the case right now. So the work that we have done since then has been a very extensive work to try to repair the, 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 rely, the supervisor reliance on internal models and ensure some consistency across banks and some reliability uh, and trust. Uh, because the, the, the li lack of trust was started building up also in the industry itself. Because many banks were saying, well, I have a very high uh, risk with asset density, uh, but my competitor in the neighboring country under the responsibility of another authority has a similar portfolio, but much lower risk with assets. So there is no competitive advantage, no competitive uh, equality, and the like. So we made a, a huge work to try to ensure exactly that, reliability and comparability. 
As these killed, these use tests, and the, uh, as you correctly say, the idiosyncrasy, the fact that each bank is different. Well, I think we, di we really didn't, because uh, uh, all the, the work we are doing in the ECB now with uh, TRIM, the targeted review of internal models, or which the EBA has done, uh, for instance, in the benchmarking, is really to develop some common criteria in the areas where you, I mean, we're actually, in our view, there were not compliance with the, with the regulation already before. So give clear guidance on what is expected, for instance, in the treatment of defaulted assets or, uh, or uh, stressed LGDs and the like. But uh, at the same time, you leave a lot of leeway to the, to the, to the banks, to the, the risk managers at the banks to shape their own models. And we do benchmarking and challenge. So if you see that for the same type of assets, you have a bank which is uh, coming a little bit uh, as an outlier, then you start a supervisory process challenging. But if the bank convinces you that their model are right and that uh, the outcome is, uh, is uh, correctly measuring risk, we will have nothing to say about that. So we need to strike this balance between the two, the two objectives. OK. We have one in the bottom. Yes? Yes, Yoga from BPI. And so a few moments ago, you mentioned digitalization. And I have a question about uh, fintechs. And in one hand, uh, we see that uh, the new uh, capital requirements uh, regulation, uh, it seems to introduce the um, same level or even more capital requirements on banks. And uh, in the other hand, uh, we see that uh, um, specific regulation directed to um, investment firms uh, are also being drafted, I think. So my question is, don't you think that uh, European Central Bank and uh, EVA should also create um, a legal framework for fintechs? Thank you. Mm. Well, uh, so let me put it like this. Um, if a fintech company does banking activity, as it is defined now in European legislation, which is mainly collecting deposits and uh, granting loans, it is a bank. It needs to comply with all the, 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 the full monty of banking regulations, bank supervision, as any other, as any other player. Um, if instead the fintech company uh, does a specific uh, subset of uh, financial activities competing with the banks in that specific segment, well, then there are different, uh, for instance, take the payments area, which is the area where the fintech uh, sector has invested the most. In this area, Elisa knows that very well because she was in the European Parliament when these legislations were passed, it has been a deliberate choice of the uh, legislators to increase the level of competition to the banking industry from non-bank third-party providers. No? So there was a deliberate uh, objective to increase uh, competition and to have a lighter regulation of payments institutions than of banks. So if uh, a fintech wants to provide uh, payment services and compete with a bank in that area, they have to comply with the, payment, with the requirements for payments institutions. And, uh, and uh, that's, uh, again, absolutely fine. And I think that uh, at the beginning, the banking industry was rather complaining you know, on, the, uh, on, on uh, the access, especially, for instance, of these providers to the bank accounts of the customers directly, you know, uh, to the information the, in, in, the, in the accounts, the, the sort of what sometimes is called open banking. And, uh, uh, but now they've also themselves started providing the services in competition with the, uh, with the, with the fintech companies. Sometimes they have partnered with fintech companies or they bought fintech companies. So I think that eventually uh, there is going to be an advantage for, uh, for the final users of, of these services. So in, in a nutshell, I would say that uh, if somebody is doing banking, needs to be supervised exactly as a bank and do everything like, like a bank. If you are doing different uh, segments, uh, I mean, of course, you, you are allowed to have a lighter regulation and, uh, and, uh, and to compete with the bank in that specific segment. But this competition, uh, so far, I don't think has been detrimental to the banks. Actually, the banks have reacted in the positive way 
and this is uh, leading to better uh, services for the customers. Maybe one of the areas where I'm a little bit more concerned is the role that big techs are taking in this, in this area because the uh, companies like you know Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon, uh, uh, I mean, they have a possibility of starting uh, uh, picking on the on different points of the value chain creation for the bank. No, so the, the uh, from the payments to the uh, FX services when you buy something abroad uh, to the uh, consumer credit uh, to the so that and they have an amount of information and uh, and uh, and captive customers that is quite. Uh, quite uh, impressive. So uh, that's an area in which maybe we need to think a little bit more about, uh, uh, about how the, the, the unbundling of services uh, would uh, affect the, the, the overall uh, credit creation process. OK. Good afternoon. My name is Ned Martins. I work at CGD at with the Compliance Department. Uh, in our country, Bank of Portugal is responsible for surveilling uh, the implementation of the um, obligations regarding anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing. On this regard, uh, how do you rate uh, the, the exchange of information between ECB and the national supervisor? Thank you. Thank you. Well, the, uh, the, thank you. The, the, this Nothing is in this No, no. This is uh, this <laughs> a, a, an area in which, of course, as you as you can imagine, we have been uh, uh, thinking a lot. We are still thinking. We had this in the agenda of our supervisory board last week, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. And. Uh, um, as you know, as you correctly say, the ECB is not the, an AML supervisor. Uh, Anti-money laundering responsibilities are clearly not attributed to the ECB, and they remain with the, uh, with the national authorities. Uh, still, there are a number of areas in which uh, our activities, to some extent, interact with the, with the activities of uh, anti-money laundering supervisors. Think of the licensing process, fit and proper, uh, uh, internal governance, internal controls, uh, uh, also withdrawal of license. I mean, there are a number of areas in which, basically, uh, the, the, the legislation itself, now also the, the, in the in the supervisory review and evaluation process, the legislation will request uh, the uh, prudential supervisor to consider also uh, anti-money laundering uh, uh, issues. So this means that we need to cooperate more and more with the authorities uh, which are competent for, uh, for uh, anti-money laundering at the national level. We have uh, uh, signed an MOU in January this year mm -hmm. with all the uh, European AML supervisors on exchange of information and cooperation. And we have already started, I would say very positively, a, a, a system by means of which anything we find in our own site inspections, for instance, which may be relevant for the National Anti-Money Laundering Authorities, we pass it to them as information for their further use and, uh, and, and the other way around. When, uh, when a, a, an Anti-Money Laundering Authority finds problems, they, they inform us. So, and we are now thinking how to make this interaction and also our focus on AML issues as, uh, as uh, let's say, effective as possible. To avoid duplications, because of course we know that uh, from the uh, compliance side, uh, let's say, you don't want to deal uh, for the same topic with uh, uh, hundreds of authorities. So we are trying to streamline this as much as possible. But of course, uh, we need to, you know, to find a way yeah. to, to deal with this in a joint, uh, in a joint up fashion. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Do we have anyone else? Here. Uh, hello, good afternoon for all. Um, my question is about fit and proper models. And um, if it's possible in the, in the future to have uh, um, only one model for uh, all the European Central uh, Bank participants, and in the same matter, of fit and, and proper, um, 
gender diversity is very important in the in the boards of the banking institutions. But uh, how, um, in your opinion, uh, how it must be implemented? Uh, thank you all. Sorry, and BCP, right? Uh, sorry, ah, Marta Flip from Credit Agricole. Ah, yes, sorry for you that. We're on the same line. On that side. Thank you. <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> Nobody more than us would like to have uh, a single approach to fit and proper because, of course, uh, now, as you know, the fit and proper requirements are spelled out in the directive, which is implemented in different ways at the national, in all the, the uh, 28 uh, member states and 19 for us. And, uh, and then also the national uh, approaches, also administrative approaches follow so far have been quite different. This means that when, when the ECB is responsible for fit and proper uh, assessments as to run uh, the same type of assessments, sometimes even for the same person maybe, <laughs> in, two different, uh, in two different countries, in two institutions in two different countries, uh, we need to run a completely different, sometimes completely different uh, uh, procedure in terms of times, in terms of uh, you know, uh, what we can check, what we cannot check, and the like. We could even come to different, uh, different outcomes. Uh, because of the different uh, way in which the law is implemented, the European law is implemented in national, in national member, in member states. So this is, of course, for us uh, uh, not only a, a, an administrative nightmare, but also something which is not, uh, not good for, for level playing field, for efficiency, for effectiveness. So uh, indeed, I remember I was still at the EBA, and I, I, I wrote a letter together with Daniel Nui asking the, the Parliament Council and commission to consider harmonization of fit and proper requirements in the, in the last legislative round. Unfortunately, uh, this was not uh, accepted. So uh, we have to live for the moment being with these differences. And, uh, and there is uh, uh, little we can do for the moment being. So, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll keep going in this, in this way. But you, you are absolutely right. I mean, this, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, very suboptimal, to say the least. Um, you raised the issue of gender diversity, um, which is a topic which is also now addressed in the legislation. The EBA produces uh, uh, regularly reports on gender diversity in, in bank boards, uh, monitoring that and reporting to the European institutions. And there have been some progresses, but indeed this, this remains a, a, relevant, uh, a relevant issue. Um, this is, I think, important. It is important. I mean, I would say the diversity is important in different uh, uh, direction in boards. Boards uh, having different views in boards, having people that is able to challenge uh, decisions of the executives, uh, I think is uh, key to uh, a, a good governance in the banks. We have seen, if you look at the, the, the most difficult cases we have had, uh, uh, Let's say not only in recent years, but generally, also from my when I started my supervisory career in the Bank of Italy in the early 90s, it was exactly the same. When you have a dominant CEO, when nobody is challenging, where you have a very homogeneous culture, everybody is, is doing exactly the, the same thing, thinking exactly the same way, you can be sure that eventually the bank is uh, going to crash against the wall. And uh, so having diversity is uh, a diversity in uh, professional background, diversity in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, experience, expertise. Uh, uh, what you need to know to run a bank now is so wide uh, that, that you cannot have everybody knowing everything. No? Uh, you need to have a diversity of, uh, of profiles. And gender diversity is an important element in that respect as well. We cannot do, uh, let's say, we cannot, of course, uh, push this again by regulation or legislation. I think that would not be appropriate. But we, we can and we do highlight to boards when we are dissatisfied in terms of the diversity that we see in boards. The interesting thing about it is coming from credit, uh, credit agricola is that progressively 
de, de little units, de caixinhas, are, are, are turning to include more uh, gender balance in their... Yes. Uh, we are always making this, uh, insisting <laughs> that they should diversify, that they should modernize, that they should have qualified people, because banking... Banking is a very serious business. Eh? You cannot just put the nice guy that is, uh, I mean, you've got to, to know, to, to, to be informed, and probably the new generation is really a source of uh, positive hope, but, uh, but it, is, it is really something that progressively we see the, the, the change by insisting uh, we are trying to be moderate in the pressure that we put and, uh, and never go into, okay, uh, uh, due to, to, to gender concerns to, to put someone that is incompetent in the job. I mean, that's not the purpose. Yes. Uh, the purpose is really to, to make people look in the market for competent people with a diversified approach. Uh, and this, uh, this takes time, but it, I think, I think, I, I hope I'm not wrong, but uh, I think it's, it's getting into the, the mind of people that, that really you need to, to, to have qualified, informed people that are available to spend time in, in that uh, specific uh, task and with uh, a multiple way of looking at things. And we, are, we talk a lot about gender, it's obvious, but also uh, different experiences and eventually even different ages so that you, you have a kind of a, mix, a mixed uh, vision on, 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 on subjects. But yes, uh, this is uh, something that we have been following very carefully, so it's... Let me see if I may add one point. I mean, uh, you correctly put the two things together, no? fit and proper on one end and the diversity on the other. I mean, the problem I have, this is really something I'm scratching my head about, is that the fit and proper is a very legal, legal process. No? So for us, the bar is very high to say that somebody is not fit and proper to be a member of the board of the bank. No? So you need to have evidence. I mean, this, if you say to somebody, you cannot sit in a board of the bank, you are actually banning this person from the banking sector. So it's a big decision, which is going to be challenged for sure, uh, and you need to have uh, very strong evidence that something is wrong. Uh, in many cases, what we see is uh, not that you have people who are not fit and proper, but exactly that the board is not, you know, when you look at the board in its, uh, uh, in its uh, totality, you see that there is something wrong there. You see that there is something which is not uh, giving you enough reassurances uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of a good governance, of a diversity, and, and the like. So we don't have strong tools there. No? We don't have the bazooka of a fit and proper uh, <laughs> decision. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I thought, well, maybe you should use more what uh, in, in the old time of central bank was, was called moral suasion. No? So you call somebody say, look, I mean, this is not really looking pretty. Maybe you should consider changing. And of course, you, you see on the other side that people, of, of course, immediately uh, follows up. Uh, that's not how it is going, actually. <laughs> I noticed that uh, the moral suasion is not working as well as it, as it used in the good old days. No? So, mm -hmm. so it's very difficult for the supervisor to affect this aspect. But it is, uh, it is something which uh, uh, which is, in my view, crucial. And uh, we need to think more and more on how to you know, increase our, our pressure on, on these aspects, which is not anymore you know, the capital requirement, things on which you have a strong legal basis as a supervisor, but something on which, in any case, you need to, to make sure that, uh, that the cultural change in the banks is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is being actually brought to completion. And, uh, and this is an area in which I'm not yet confident we are, we are we have achieved enough. But from our experience here, and uh, I speak under a co the control of, of, of Anna Hitt and, uh, and Louise and Isabel, because uh, we feel that the qualitative aspects, uh, the governance aspects are really sometimes even more important yeah, than the more quantitative ones, absolutely. because uh, the quality of the people that take decisions, what are the basis for this, their decisions, uh, has been has been evidenced as uh, as one of the sources of risk. Yeah. 
and uh, and so the, we take very seriously the fit and proper, and and it is important that really there is a coherence in the criteria yeah. in the same in the internal market and the, in particular in the banking union and that the and that supervision. It's 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 also it's always easier to have uh, quantitative than qualitative because it's more subjective. But anyway, I think as you mentioned, it's a cultural thing, a culture that has got to be put in practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, my name is Ana Muniz Macedo. I'm from the legal department of Novo Banco. And my question is related to fintechs again. Um, do you think that uh, fintechs are uh, a game changer? And how do you see the, the business, uh, the banking business activity uh, in the next uh, 10, 10 years, 10 or 20 years? Well, in the, surely they are a game changer. I mean, uh, new technologies will uh, play a, a strong role. Already now, uh, if you look, I mean, tomorrow I will be in, in a conference here in Lisbon, and uh, I will focus my remarks on, uh, on profitability, you know, on the, the problem of profitability at, uh, at European banks. But if you look now at the distribution of uh, return on equity or return on assets uh, at European banks, you clearly see that uh, the banks which are, uh, let's say, better placed in terms of profitability right now are those who have been more effective, especially in investing in new technologies and restructuring their distribution network and, uh, and, uh, and, re and achieving better cost efficiency, basically, especially in a period of low rates as, as we are right now. So um, uh, new technologies are indeed an important, uh, an important uh, element. Uh, Fintech companies are, a, a, indeed, they are a game changer because they, have developed, they are developing new, uh, new tools, uh, new innovative tools. Sometimes, uh, from a regulatory point of view, a supervisory point of view, I am a bit uh, concerned because, of course, they lack the, uh, the compliance culture, which is, of course, very well rooted in the, in the, in the banking sector. I remember I was in a meeting with uh, a number of uh, fintech companies, virtual currency providers, and the like. And the, the question I received m most frequently was uh, whether I could put all my rule book in a sort of algorithm so that they can put it into, the, into their, <laughs> into their <laughs> let's say, uh, mm -hmm. machines and then forget about, uh, about all the compliance issues. So it's clear that there is a, a cultural challenge there. But in general, let's say they are a. Uh, I, at the beginning, they were presented very much as disruptors, no? So as entities that would have actually displaced the uh, the, the the incumbents, the banking uh, the banking industry. At the moment, I think that they are more a a, a, a challenger. But uh, as I said before, you have different uh, dynamics that have been unfolding. Some banks have developed their own internal fintech, uh, uh, let's say, division or subsidiary. Some have both uh, fintech companies. Some have partnered with them. Uh, and if you look at the market structure in several countries in these uh, innovative services, sometimes you have banks and fintech companies competing on, on, the same, on the same footing. So it could indeed have a change, of course, if ba there will be some banks which are laggards in this area, and they might face indeed a competitive uh, uh, challenge for their survival in the longer term. Uh, but if banks are, are, are understanding what's going on and reacting, I think that the fintech challenge is not, uh, is not uh, uh, tremendous. Uh, I mean, can be bored. For us as supervisors, the challenge will be to exactly continuously police the perimeter of supervision. So to understand whether the entities that we are supervising, whether we are supervising all the entities which can create yes, risks uh, uh, to the system as, as a whole. And, uh, yeah. and sometimes uh, we might uh, lag behind. I mean, that's, uh, that's difficult no, to understand. Uh, we've seen already in, in the run-up to the crisis that uh, you know, the, the different phases of the banking uh, uh, production process were broken broken into different bits and pieces, no? with the, uh, 
mortgage brokers, uh, uh, then uh, rating agencies, uh, securitization, uh, special purpose vehicles for securitization and the like. So you had a, a, a banking chain that was built outside the regulated sector. We cannot rule out with, with the fintech uh, developments, you could have uh, the same type of, uh, uh, of developments occurring. So we need to be very alert and police the, uh, the perimeter of supervision, yeah. make sure that if somebody is doing banking, <laughs> actually is attracted under the, uh, the uh, supervision as any, as any other bank. So that will be indeed, uh, indeed our challenge, I think. If you, we had oh, one, oh, 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 a key, a key. Yes, one here, one, but I think the, the, on the bottom it raises the hand first, yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Rodrigo, I'm from Bank BPI, and I, I would like to know what are ECB views on the low profitability of several European banks in comparison with US and Asia, and how does that play with the higher compliance risk requirements for the banks? Um, well, first of all, I would, uh, uh, I know that this is controversial when talking to bankers, but I would like to, uh, uh, <laughs> to push back on the, on the argument that uh, higher capital requirements are the driver of low profitability. And uh, on this, let's say, uh, I think that the, uh, uh, the fact, the simple fact is, uh, first of all, that you have uh, uh, jurisdictions like the US, for instance, which have implemented uh, exactly the same requirements uh, in, uh, in Basel. Actually, they have gold-plated uh, the requirements in Basel with higher leverage ratios and, uh, and with how higher uh, uh, liquidity requirements. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the US banks, as you were pointing out, uh, are indeed more profitable than the European banks. But also within Europe, if you look, I mean, you have a distribution of uh, of uh, uh, return on equity and return on assets, which is uh, very different, uh, and uh, or even within a, an individual member state, which uh, re uh, reflects the fact that uh, uh, regula the regulatory framework cannot be the only, uh, the only driver. Uh, indeed, let's say there was a, a definite objective of the policy makers in the regulatory reforms, because the very high return on equities that we had seen before the crisis in the 20, 25% range, uh, well above other industries, uh, were actually uh, explained uh, by the uh, excessively high leverage with which the banks were actually operating. So that, uh, that is something that, uh, as we have seen, was uh, given incentive to excessive risk taking and was not uh, tolerable for the uh, general perspective. So, but indeed, I mean, uh, having said that, I, I acknowledge that uh, the low profitability of European banks is a concern for us as supervisors. I mean, as a supervisor, you want to see banks which are healthy, generates uh, good profits, attract investors, and, uh, and are, uh, uh, again, attractive investment propositions for, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and this is not where the European banks are right now. Uh, the, the price to book, I think the average price to book of European banks is below 50, uh, so 50 cents on the euro. And uh, this also means as a supervisor that if you need to, you know, to ask a bank to raise capital, it's very difficult for them to go to the market and raise uh, fresh capital. So low profitability is, is indeed an issue. Um, what we can do to address this, of course, we, we cannot, as supervisor, let's say, have a profit objective uh, for, for the banks, but what we can do is to, and we do actually, is to put pressure on banks to uh, deal with uh, cost efficiency issues. Uh, investment in technologies, as I mentioned before, is an important element. We, de we made at the ECB an analysis of uh, business models. I think it was one e year and a half ago. Uh, which show that uh, the strategic steering capabilities of, of the board, for instance, are a key driver of profitability. So we are also pushing uh, uh, you know, bankers to refocus business model and to increase their strategic steer. Uh, but there are also st some structural impediments to profitability. And I think that two of them in interrelated are lack of consolidation and uh, remaining excess capacity in the system 
and a lack of integration within the, within the euro area and the EU in general. I mean, these two things m mean that uh, uh, there is still, uh, you know, uh, difficulty in, in recovering, in recovering, uh, in recovering profitability, and I think we should try to do something to address these issues. No, that on the third row, but we'll get there. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Miguel Valente. I work uh, in the legal department of Credit Agricola. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, when drafting rules and guidelines, uh, to what point are specific realities of cooperative groups taken into consideration? Thank you very much. Well, uh, the, the, first of all, let me say that since I w already when I was at the, at the European Banking Authority, the dialogue with the European uh, uh, cooperative banks has been always very intense. There has always been a lot of engagement. I've been participating in a lot of uh, meetings with the European Association of Cooperative Banks and with different uh, cooperatives. Actually, I was also invited uh, a couple of times, which was an interesting experience, I, I must say. Uh, to visit not the the top the top brass let's say of the of the cooperative groups but to visit the local cooperatives uh, part of some groups just to see what were their difficulties in dealing with compliance issues and the like so the, the engagement has always been very very intense of course the, the, the there are specificities of cooperatives for instance when you look at uh, definition of capital or some uh, uh, let's say more specific accounting issues, but there are also, um, let's say, more uh, general topics. I mean, the, the topic we have discussed the most is proportionality with, uh, with, uh, with the cooperative banking sector. Uh, and uh, it is an ongoing dialogue. I mean, we know that uh, whenever we, we, we meet, uh, uh, we argue that we have done a lot in terms of proportionality, and the industry argues that, uh, argues that we have not done enough <laughs> in terms of proportionality. And uh, uh, I think that uh, that is a journey. I mean, something that we will need to continue working on. It's clear that with the reform of the dimension that we, uh, that we have uh, uh, put forward after the crisis, especially when you have uh, uh, small local banks, even if they are integrated in larger groups, the, um, the fixed cost of compliance by construction becomes much higher and becomes uh, much more burdensome. So uh, can we do something to address that? We can. I think that we are doing it in terms of the intensity of supervision. We have different uh, boxes in which we slot all the banks, and we, have, we try to graduate the intensity of supervision according to the systemic relevance and complexity of the banks. Um, we have also in the regulation, for instance, in the reporting. Reporting is always a big issue. No? Uh, I remember when I was at the EBA, we made a calculation that if you are a plain vanilla uh, bank doing uh, deposit taking and uh, and, uh, and plain uh, lending, uh, uh, basically without internal models, without anything specific, uh, you would need to comply with 10% of the total uh, COREP and FINREP, which are the, the, the European standards on, on reporting. While, uh, of course, a large and complex bank will have to, to, do, to comply with, uh, with all of that. But still, let's say, in the recent uh, legislative package, there has been a requirement to do even more, to try to reduce the compliance cost. The EBA will have to, uh, let's say, come up with proposals on that, and we're also committed to, to do our own, uh, our own uh, review uh, in that respect. So the engagement is very very, very intense, and, uh, and we are very aware of what are the issues for this segment of the industry. Good afternoon. My name is Katerina from Kasha. Um, my question is about bureaucracy and reporting templates and all the burden that banks have nowadays um, that um, could um, jeopardize the decision-making process in a timely and effective manner. Because when you are a manager and you have lots of reports, 
um, you could see data in different ways. And um, this could, uh, um, this could uh, uh, delay your decision making. Um, spe specifically, I would like to say, say that uh, while uh, you, you are doing transversal exercises like ICAP or recovery plan or um, the EU-wide stress test, um, the ECB uh, can change template like five times. How do you see this burden <laughs> for the institutions? Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, maybe this will surprise you, but I'm sure it will be one of the main topic, uh, we'll, we'll, topics we will discuss with the, uh, the supervisors <laughs> here. Yeah. Uh, this issue is not an issue only on the industry side. It's an issue also on the supervisory side. So we, we do indeed have uh, a, a challenge in the sense that this uh, massive effort to build European supervision uh, means to a large extent that uh, when you have to bring different approaches across across member states under a, under a single umbrella in a single place, the way in which we uh, we know how to do it at the European level is to sit around the table and write a paper. So you you have a tendency, a natural tendency, to become a little bit. Uh, excessively rules-based in the way in which you develop your, your approaches, which means that, uh, again, also from the supervisory side, you might have supervisors that tend to you know, follow the rule book, follow the, the, the internal guidance and the like, and then they tick all the boxes, but maybe they don't have enough time to actually look at what the real risks at the banks are and what, uh, and what the, the, the real problems to be addressed are. And uh, that's a, that is something which is uh, key for us as well. As I said, I think it was uh, unavoidable, probably, in, in the first phase in which we had to build this, uh, this new machine and, and make it work. Uh, now we need to, uh, to move to a more mature stage of the whole construction, and this will need to, uh, to require also some efforts in simplification. Uh, and we have already had a, an internal simplification uh, mm -hmm. uh, group that has worked to try to tackle exactly these issues. Uh, for instance, one of the, uh, of the outcomes of this uh, simplification group has been that we should uh, uh, develop a sort of uh, uh, repos uh, repository of, uh, uh, of, of reporting and templates so that we try to see at least uh, what are the different requests which are coming from different maybe directorate generals, from different uh, stress tests, liquidity, uh, recovery planning, as you say, and try to see whether we can streamline that and avoid asking the same uh, information twice, try to stabilize the templates, the requirements, and, uh, and try to move to a more, uh, let's say, uh, to a lighter uh, framework. Having said that, let me also say that what surprised me a lot in these first six months at the ECB is the amount of findings that I had from on-site inspections on uh, uh, the quality of IT infrastructures, data management, data integrity at banks all across Europe. There is no, mm -hmm. not one country, mm -hmm. the other, this type of bank. That it's across types of banks, across countries. Yeah. That's a real issue. I mean, I think that there is a problem that the banking industry has that maybe because, you know, you grew at, uh, towards different mergers, there are legacy systems, you patched up different ITs and the like, sometimes also different requirements from the supervisors, maybe the national central banks, the national supervisor, the, 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 the ECB, the EBA and the like. So everything is disseminated in different places, it's very difficult to... To, to have it together. I think that uh, using also this effort to put the house in order on the banking side in terms of how you manage data and how you, you integrate your system, I think that that would be very, very useful. For instance, one point that uh, attracts me a lot is a, is a system which the ECB is now working. It's called BIRD. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but uh, it's, a, it's a system which is aimed at developing a dictionary 
of common definitions of banking aggregates that would allow banks to basically report regularly on these uh, granular, let's say, uh, uh, let's say data points, and then instead of asking every time additional data, additional data collection, it would be up to each supervisor or central banks to pick up this granular data and build them and, and aggregate them in the way they like and they need so that you don't have you know, repetitive and continuous requests from different, uh, from different angles. I think that's something which has been experimented in, in Italy and those trade has worked well and maybe we should think about a system like that. I'm Bernardo Caldas from Novo Banco, working in data science and artificial intelligence. So I think the question goes perfectly with your last answer. Um, so, um, and just so you know, I've recently joined Novo Banco, coming from a different industry and a different sector. Um, and I've seen a lot of impact, and I think we've all seen it, um, of artificial intelligence commercially um, when, you, when you look at applications. But when I think about risk management, when I think about any man laundering, um, I see also tremendous potential of using these techniques to make the banking system more robust um, and safer uh, in general. So I wanted to ask you about your views on um, how we should be using these new technologies um, as a regulator and as a supervisor, how we should be using these technologies to make the system safer, and also what's blocking us from, from doing that. So why are big techs doing that, that so much and taking so much, so much advantage of that and we are lacking that? It's a, it's a good question, and uh, I'm not sure I have a, I have a uh, very smart answer to that. Uh, maybe what I can say is that we are trying ourselves to invest in this, in this area. We have had a, a first experiment. It's a very narrow one, very specific. But uh, for instance, we have uh, areas in which we have uh, uh, very lengthy, uh, complex, uh, detailed applications. For instance, in the area of passporting. I mean, there, and there are many of them. And they are continuously updated. So it's really a hassle in terms of the administrative burden of dealing with that. So we have developed a, an artificial intelligence tool that is able to scan all these applications and they like you know what has changed what are the relevant issues and uh, and uh, see whether there is anything so that it streamlines a lot the, the bureaucratic work for us uh, to deal with these uh, with these applications so I see that there is uh, uh, th there are a number of areas in which you have a heavily uh, bureaucratic uh, work on our side and on the side of, of course of, of the banks as well in which maybe the compliance process could be streamlined uh, quite significantly by using artificial intelligence. Uh, Anti-money laundering is not our cup of tea but is another mm -hmm. area which is in which sometimes I'm wondering whether the system we have is the best we can. I mean it's very paper based, it's very cumbersome on customers and doesn't manage in many cases to catch up the big crooks. No? So, uh, uh, so maybe we can use more this type of uh, uh, systems to identify uh, uh, red lights no, that can be uh, addressing the authorities to the, relevant, uh, to the relevant points. So this means that artificial intelligence can also be used on the supervisory side probably as a, as a tool for uh, identifying where are the main risks in certain, in certain areas. We're still at the very beginning, but we are investing on it. Um, I would like to raise the subject that you mentioned in, a, uh, in an interview not long ago. You said Portuguese banks have been doing some interesting work in reducing their NPL portfolios. However, however, <laughs> uh, you said that they should finish building the roof while the sun is out. Do you think that amount of pressure might actually uh, make uh, make give us some prejudice in the longer term strategy to return to profitability? And if so, how is the ECB planning on dealing with that? Thank you. No, it, 
exactly. First of all, let me acknowledge. I mean, the, 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 the Portuguese. I mean, the Portuguese banking sector has done uh, a lot in terms of uh, addressing the the the, the NPL uh, the NPL problem. Uh, as you know, we have developed these policies, identifying targets for banks, and uh, uh, banks in Portugal have overachieved those targets, and and uh, they have uh, let's say uh, taken opportunity of a of a of a good macroeconomic environment to let's say make uh, make progress uh, uh, in, in that direction uh, still let's say that the levels remain relatively high uh, and uh, at least in in comparison with the with the European average so the point is that uh, again uh, as there is uh, still a, a good economic uh, economic uh, situation it is important to take all the opportunities to uh, to complete uh, to complete the job and uh, Again, in terms of the impact on profitability, you know, uh, uh, before there was this uh, reference comparison also with uh, with uh, with the U.S. No, for instance, I mean, I really, I'm, this is really something I've been saying since 2011. I'm con deeply convinced of that. The big difference between the EU and the U.S. is that the U.S. has decided to front load the adjustment all at the beginning. Also with taxpayers' money, eh? I mean, they put uh, 600 billion dollars of uh, the TARP uh, on the table, and they put Fannie, Fannie and Fred, Fannie, uh, Fannie Mae Fannie and Freddie Mac, Mac. Uh, to the work in terms of cleaning the balance sheets of the banks. They forced the bank to recapitalize up front quite a lot. Uh, and uh, making them also uh, accept uh, uh, preference shares from the state, and the banks were then forced to clean up the balance sheets. And this process was completed in three years. So in three years, the US banks got to the NP NPL ratio that they had before the crisis. <coughs> we are now, let's say, <coughs> 10 years after the crisis, and we are still, let's say, above, above the, we have not reached, on average, the pre-crisis pre level. So I think that uh, if you look also at, uh, let, let me take the case of Italy, which I know because I, I've seen it also, uh, uh, let's say, more, 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 when I was a supervisor there. Um, when you see uh, the, the, the game changer there has been when some banks have decided to buy the bullet and make some big sales of NPLs, and the impact on the equity prices was positive. Then the other banks started, the, then, then this was a game changer, you know, because all the other banks also started uh, I investing in that, and the profitability eventually mm -hmm. benefited, because of course, if you, if you have, uh, if, you, if you download uh, the, the, the NPLs, you take the capital hit up, up front, but then you, you free up your balance sheet and you can do more profitable business, rather than keep your capital locked on loans that are not paying back. So eventually, let's say, I think that, uh, uh, that there has been also on the side of the, of the industry, sometimes also in, in our own camp, in the supervisory community, a little bit of myopia, you know, of the idea that if you, if you take a little bit more time, things are going to be less painful. And actually, I really believe that uh, in this area, the faster you are, the more brutal you are <laughs> at the beginning, uh, uh, the more bitter the medicine maybe in, in a short period of time, but the, the, the easier and faster the rebound is. And uh, so I, I remain convinced of that. And, uh, and again, a lot has been done in the last two years in Portugal. Yeah, I mean, the uh, NPLs have been out. So, yeah. uh, more the, than the, half now. And, and, and I think that now we are seeing uh, the, the, the benefit also yeah. in terms yeah. of profitability yeah. and in terms problem of... problem is that sometimes you cannot afford it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, and, you, you, and our, our cost of capital to replenish is, is too, too expensive. So, I mean, it's... Uh, but I completely agree. But but the, your comparison with the United States raises a lot of issues in, rela in, in relation to another element that is more of a macro, but that micro impacts. That's that's the the, the 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 fact that the whole scheme of banking union is not yet completely finished yeah. and complete. And so, what the Americans did is a good lesson for us. But we, I mean. 
we are but still you know, I mean, far away from there. Let, I mean, this is, uh, this, I, I want to say this because I think yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, really, it encapsulates my judgment of what is wrong in the European Union right now. No? Mm -hmm. In uh, uh, 2008, Lehman, no? I was in, uh, working at the Bank of Italy. I was head of department there and uh, uh, in the policy, in the policy area. Uh, and uh, head of the policy area. And uh, I remember I received one day a memo that was coming from the Dutch finance ministry that was proposing to create a European bailout fund. So the idea was uh, uh, we have a crisis which really? is affecting what did you do with it? Which is affecting <laughs> which is affecting all the all the uh, all the European banks. Uh, so we should uh, build up a, a, a European fund to support the banks to overcome this uh, this issue after after um, after Lima. And at the time the Italian uh, government and authorities, including the Bank of Italy, where I worked, had the, uh, the, the impression that uh, this was not our crisis. This was structural finance, was uh, banks that had engaged in, you know, in uh, complex uh, structural products. We had, our banks have not done that. They are plain vanilla banks doing uh, loans. So I, I didn't manage to finish my memo supporting the scheme because I was really believing that we needed a European uh, uh, framework yeah. to address the crisis that basically the Italian government had given a negative uh, opinion on the on the project. No? So it's so, you to be blamed. So, oh. the, so the risk reduction. <laughs> no, no. I mean, of, of course, the, 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 the Italian joking. government would not have been. Uh, the, of course, there were I'm other joking. governments. I would not mention mm -hmm. here because I was not involved in those uh, authorities that were also firing on the proposal. So it was actually killed very fast. <laughs> But uh, uh, let's say this to show that the this mm. risk reduction, risk sharing type of yeah. debate sometimes uh, turns around. No, I mean yeah. people who are on one side of the debate at a certain juncture can find themselves at the other side yeah. of the debate yeah. Uh, yeah. at a different juncture. So the point is that everybody is so short-sighted not to see that we are in a in a prisoner's dilemma, in which cooperating and. Mm. Uh, setting up common structures makes everybody better off, while if everybody wants to go alone, everybody is worse off. And, yeah, uh, but, but it's that, so yeah. difficult, so difficult that, that to ri understand that. Rise, that. It, that raises another, another element that is, I mean, the engagement of, of people in some projects, uh, policy projects, European policy projects, yeah. that requires that really there is someone putting pressure on politicians to at least to finish what we have started in terms of banking union the instruments because otherwise we are really been a bit a bit stuck and we have several exam examples that pop up from this kind of discussion but okay we have on the second row the German yeah. with the the, 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 the third tie or whatever there <laughs> yeah. hello uh, Hello, uh, João Miranda from Millennium BCP. I'm from the Investments and Savings Products Department. Um, this is a follow-up question to something that's been discussed this afternoon, uh, namely regarding profitability. Given the current um, negative central rates that do not seem that they will change anywhere anytime soon at least, um, and coupled with what we are doing with better risk profiles and being more careful with the type of loans that we're giving out, um, there is some impact on profitability on banks and especially I would say on southern banks and periphery banks such as the ones in Portugal. My question is this could lead to some sort of um, bank consolidation that we've uh, we've experienced before and that might come again. And how do you see this particularly vis-a-vis -vis your comments regarding more um, competition coming from fintechs, for example? Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, uh, I mean, negative rates, it goes without saying, of course, uh, uh, put some pressure on, on interest margins. That's uh, clear and uh, straightforward. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, looking at that only is a bit simplistic, because one should look at the counterfactual. Now, what would happen 
if the uh, if the ECB uh, stance would have been less accommodating, and what would have been the macroeconomic outlook, uh, and what would have been uh, the uh, asset quality I impact. I mean, it's clear that if you have uh, lower interest rates, it's also a, a, a situation in which uh, you know the burden for borrowers is lower. You can have borrowers coming back to uh, to to let's say to uh, uh, to health. Uh, uh, in an easier way, and uh, you have uh, less difficulties also in dealing with the uh, with the non-performing loans issue. Of course, there is a differential impact according to the type of banks. No, the banks which are more uh, intensive in terms of deposit taking, so that cannot go, of course, in negative territory because nobody is charging negative rates on depositors. Uh, of course, are going to be um, affected a bit more. Uh, so there are some differential impacts. But my my point is that in general, let's say uh, this is a, a situation which is going to uh, stay for longer, and uh, uh, the banking sector needs to adjust to that to some extent. And again, for me, the, the lesson is uh, use this window as uh, effectively as possible to deal with the asset quality issues, to uh, refocus the business model, uh, to deal with the cost efficiency issues, and, uh, and move ahead. And uh, bank consolidation could be part of that, indeed. Uh, uh, any, if you look at any industry that has gone through a, a, a crisis globally, the automobile industry, the steel industry, after this, in the run-up to the crisis, you build up a lot of excess uh, of capacity. Then the crisis comes, and you have excess capacity in the, in the sector, and you need to mop up this excess capacity. The way in which this has, has happened in all the industry has been through consolidation. And uh, in the European sector, we, we didn't have, in the European banking sector, we didn't have this. We have had some consolidation, but not a big wave of consolidation, which means that uh, we still have some banks that uh, have a maybe not viable business model that keep uh, remaining in the market, uh, thanks also to accommodating monetary policy conditions. They try to, you know, gamble for resurrection, maybe applying very, very narrow margins and competing uh, their way out of the crisis, and this is, exercising additional pressure on profitability in the sector. So consolidation would be indeed a, an important way of, of addressing, uh, of addressing these, uh, these aspects. Of course, we are supervisors, so it's not up to us to, uh, you know, uh, to design the structure of the system or enforce consolidation. It's up to the bankers. Uh, sometimes when I speak to, to, to bankers about consolidation, I see the body language in the room, which uh, becomes very, you know, very, uh, very negative because uh, in many cases bankers think that uh, uh, consolidation doesn't happen also because there are regulatory impediments or supervisory impediments to consolidation. I mean, on these, uh, as long as this is the case, let's say I'm committed to try to do what we can to remove these impediments, but eventually the choice is with the is with the um, is with the bankers, and this would be helpful also, as you say correctly, in terms of dealing with this fintech issue. So uh, this rethink of the business model, this rethink of consolidation strategies, need to be developed also with some strategic long-term thinking and uh, uh, investment in technologies, investment in uh, in uh, in uh, new distribution channels should be part of of this uh, of this thinking and the. The competition of fintech, to some extent, can accelerate this process, so it could be a positive, uh, let's say, trigger for, for the process. Yeah, in, in Portugal, we had several um, experiments in terms of consolidation. I mean, yeah. you know a lot of them, and, uh, and it is true that sometimes uh, I think this is another area where we should, uh, we should refine our, our tools. Um, uh, in particular, in what concerns the, 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 the supervisory control over uh, subsidiaries and branches. And because, in fact, uh, if you have a very, very systemic subsidiary and, uh, and you are uh, responsible uh, in, in the ultimate circumstances, you are responsible for the, for the, the, 
the, cover, the coverage of the, of, the, of the deposits if something goes wrong. Uh, so it depends on, you have, on if you have a multiple point of entry or single point of entry. In the case of branches, very big branches, uh, of course, you, you don't have to pay for the, the covered deposits, but, but you, you have a very limited oversight of the practices. And, uh, and so, I mean, uh, in, in, in normal business, uh, yes, it, it makes sense, and maybe there are some, uh, some economies, and, uh, but, but uh, there is, uh, uh, and Portugal has this uh, experience because we, we are a home and a host. Uh, so we have this, this dual capacity to see both sides. Uh, but when you are a host, in fact, and we had this trauma with, uh, with Popular, that in fact we, we, we risked to be, to be, I mean, to be asked to pay back uh, the covered deposits of a small, small, small entity, but nevertheless the covered deposits were about two billion. Uh, which at that time, for, uh, for the moment that in macroeconomic terms uh, uh, Portugal was going through, would be a really, really big blow, apart from the other impacts that, that are not a direct, but they are indirect, like, like the, the other deposits that were, could, could have been, I mean, have to be covered by the national taxpayer. So the scheme in which, e even inside banking union, we manage, uh, the, the, the control and, and the, res the, I mean, the responsibility for the supervision and resolution at the top level. And uh, when things go wrong, the, the, the kind of liabilities and the obligations that fall on the, on the, the, on the desk of the, of the host country, this is really a crucial thing. And this, this is what sometimes uh, is not, I mean, I think we should address it more carefully. Uh, but, but of course, this is this comes from an, a, a, an experience because here you, you are in a, uh, in a, in a, I mean, in a jurisdiction where we, we, we had it all, eh? so we, we can tell you a lot about the, the I mean, the costs and benefits of, of the whole thing. Uh, but it is true that that uh, I mean, for instance, do you have a, a capacity for a standalone entity in the resolution process when? Uh, the, the, the big entity goes into resolution. Uh, what can, can the entity, is the, the resolution strategy uh, uh, including a standalone condition uh, and the requirements for that? And do we have from the host country some oversight, mm -hmm. sufficient oversight? This, the, all these, these elements are very, very relevant because otherwise it's, mm, it's very imbalanced that you take decisions at European level and then you have to, uh, I mean, to, to clean the, the desk <laughs> on the, 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 the host country. It's, it, it is very imbalanced. So before, before we, we, we correct these, these missing pieces in the, in the structure, it is difficult that you have, a, a, um, I mean, an enthusiasm with, uh, with the idea of, of, of merging or uh, of, of, this, uh, of this consolidation because there are all these, when things go wrong, that's what rules are for it, so when, not when everything goes right. <laughs> but, uh, okay, but, but, but in general, I think in theory, I mean, in general, I agree, but uh, in, when it comes to the details of it, it's, it's a bit more complicated. Let me clarify that, uh, let's say, I was talking about consolidation in general, not I necessarily cross-border. Right? So, I mean, uh, actually, I to some extent, I, I'm convinced that in the first phase, where the driver for consolidation is mainly cost efficiency, you have uh, uh, the, um, the best incentives where you have overlapping distribution networks. So That's probably right. in the first phase, it's more the, the national level, which is the one which provides That's you with the greater, yeah. uh, that is right. uh, let's say, um, leeway for, for consolidation. But indeed, let's say also at the, at the European level, uh, uh, for instance, when you have, uh, uh, if, again, sorry to use, but I think we should in certain cases also use this as a benchmark. Now, if you take the US, no? You have, uh, uh, take Puerto Rico and Greece, no? Are two countries of the same size. They both basically entered into a major fiscal crisis. So the state went under great troubles. It, it defaulted in the US. It was, as I say, went in private sector in involvement at the, at the European level. Uh, and the banking sector went underwater because of that. That's natural. Big crisis in the, in the, in the state. and. Uh, so in, the, in, the, in Greece, 
basically this was all managed locally, no? Uh, the, and, and the system is still now with 45% NPR ratio. Uh, years, uh, six years after the crisis. In the US, you had the FDIC that entered the banks in the weekend, take control of the bank uh, via purchase and assumption, and started selling the assets and the liabilities of the banks in Puerto Rico and the branches to the banks in Puerto Rico to banks from other states in the US. And borrowers, depositors, didn't even notice. I mean, they received a letter saying, your bank until yesterday was called Bank A, now tomorrow it's called Bank B. Nothing changes. Nobody noticed, and, and this helped the system, you know, that the shock in Puerto Rico was distributed throughout the US. In, in Europe, the shock in Greece remained in Greece and went deeper and Greece. deeper <laughs> and deeper and deeper. I mean, this is, this is the main problem we have in the banking union right now. And if we don't have a more diversified banking sector, you will never manage to address it. But for this, I mean, uh, I, keep, I keep mentioning this example yeah. because when we started this banking union, uh, in fact, it was a post-crisis initiative and uh, when we looked around in the, I mean, the Commission and, the, and the, in the European Parliament, we were looking around and we said, okay, uh, the kind of example that you can really follow for more stability is the FDIC model. Yeah. So our purpose was to create an FDIC kind of system for Europe in which you start by uh, creating stability in the market through a guarantee of deposits. Uh, and, uh, and then it evolved politically, saying, okay, if you want a, a common guarantee of deposits, please uh, start with a single supervision. And then, yeah, well, okay, we did single supervision. Then you think, that, uh, now we go to, to single resolution. Okay, we go. And then when it came to now, when, <laughs> where is the guarantee of deposit? Mm. Uh, then we are stuck here. And, and that, that's the, the, the thing that, uh, that uh, Europeans have got to go, I mean, to go forward because otherwise it, it can't work. I mean, we, yeah. we are, it's a bit of a, but I mean, I, I think it's something that is difficult to explain to the men in the street because th what, what are you talking about? I mean, but, but uh, for people that are with the, every day in the, in the business, you realize how relevant such a thing is. Because then what, what happens is that the supervisor and the resolution authority has, as an easy task because, okay, you bail in the, the junior or you bail in and, and then you transfer and you sell and you have got a kind of a backstop, a strong backstop from the Federal Reserve that you can use to transfer it. And if you don't have a buyer at that moment, you can hold it and the buyers know that. So there is not, not this tendency to destroy the price. Uh, but in Europe, we are, I mean, we are really in the middle. Uh, let's see if the new, I mean, the new changes, if they can help, because that's one of the, of the elements that the, the IMF mentioned in the FSAB. Yeah. So we'll see if, uh, if we can do something. But it's really, I mean, it's really a major issue. But there, were, there, were, there was a question from this, yes. the, uh, from okay, the, this, the lady with the, with the, the yellow, yellow jacket, jacket yeah. and the colleague right next to her. <laughs> I'm from Credit Agricola also. I read the speech you made, you gave, I think, recently in Ireland, I think, where you talk about the importance of good governance in a good, good decision-making process in order to avoid the, the crisis in the banking sector, and overall, in the banking se sector. We are now overcoming one crisis, and my question is, do you think it can be a setback with Brexit, giving that banks in the UK and in Europe can make a lot of bad decisions, or not, we hope not, um, trying to retain clients and trying to show the market they are uh, okay and they are not affected by it. Uh, even more since uh, you are having to, uh, you will be losing the, the supervision of UK bankings. So, uh, UK banking. So, my question is do you think it can have a setback? Well, Brexit is, uh, is a challenge that goes without saying. Uh, it's, a, it's a major, uh, let's say, request, requested banks to make major adjustments. We have been pushing banks, actually. We, 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 both we, ECB, and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the Bank of England on the other side of the channel started pushing banks to make preparations for Brexit already, I think, uh, almost two years ago now. And uh, uh, 
we had a long list, and I think that we ticked all the boxes. So the banks uh, did uh, everything that we asked them to do. So in terms of assuring to have the right licenses, to continue serving their clients, uh, uh, making all the projects uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, re, uh, say, moving business uh, uh, in such a way that uh, they could continue, let's say, operating uh, in, a, in a smooth way and doing contingency planning, so preparing for adverse contingencies. Uh, so we have done all the possible uh, preparation for that. Uh, and uh, I think the banks have done all we asked them to do. I mean, at the moment, we, uh, I, I met uh, uh, Sam Woods, the, 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 the head of the Prudential Regulation Authority in the UK, a few weeks ago. We had the shortest discussion on Brexit ever. Uh, I think uh, five <laughs> minutes because we, we don't have anything to say anymore. We've done all that we thought uh, should have been done and we are happy with what the banks uh, have done in terms of preparation. Having said that, are we uh, uh, safe? Are we sure that everything will go all right? Of course not. I mean, uh, this will be uh, in any case a, 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 an event which can uh, uh, generate uh, uh, market dislocations. We see that now markets are not pricing hard Brexit uh, in uh, at all, and uh, uh, and this may happen, let's say, three months from now, basically. Uh, so there could be actually quite significant uh, uh, market disturbances associated to Brexit. And uh, uh, so I'm not, uh, let's say, I cannot say that we are in a safe place. Uh, but what I can say is that both uh, ourselves and the banks have done all that we could to prepare. So uh, we fasten the seatbelt and we hope the crash is not too, <laughs> too damaging. What can we do? Okay. Um, well, I, I think we have time for one more because we're we're getting to the end. Can so I this. Uh, okay, <laughs> the, 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 she was first apparently. <laughs> so we have room for one more. Sandra Marx from Millennium BCP. I work in marketing department. Uh, I'm responsible for the affluent and non-resident customers of Millennium BCP. And uh, I also represent Millennium BCP in the FMA, which is an association of uh, banks and the insurance companies. And uh, actually, in this uh, room, uh, in this council that uh, I can have uh, participation, uh, we are always a little bit concerned on the MIFID II and how we are coping banks uh, with this uh, regulation that uh, till now it's much more about costs and not uh, 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 of implementing it and not actually on the on the results that are we were expecting from it uh, about uh, having our customers really more com more confident about our banking system and so uh, and right, right now we have some delays some different implementations regarding all the, 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 the customer the sorry the country that are uh, uh, trying to implement it and we 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 still have this issue to 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 lead with and uh, actually we are about to start another MIFID uh, implementation well we are starting about MIFID 3 so what are you I, I want to your uh, vision about the future uh, of this uh, regulation and what we can expect more from uh, for the coming years well, uh, I will disappoint you here, I'm afraid, because uh, MIFID doesn't fall under the responsibilities of the ECB. It's more ESMA, so I, I wouldn't dare to go into the into the field of my former colleagues in Paris. Uh, uh, what I can say is that, uh, I mean, I'm uh, disappointed um, by the... Uh, lack of ambition on the Capital Markets Union project. So I think that uh, this also linked to the question on Brexit that we had before. No? Uh, uh, now, the, 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 uh, the Capital Markets Union was built originally also as a project, let's be honest, that, yeah. uh, that was uh, envisaging the, the London financial market to become the big financial hub, capital market hub for all the, 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 the union, yeah. basically. And uh, was part also of the discussion when the mm -hmm. UK was uh, uh, starting to uh, consider a referendum for a possible Brexit. 
uh, then Brexit occurred, I think there has been a lack of strategic thinking on the, uh, on the euro area side in terms of really making uh, uh, the policies that would allow a, a, a capital market, a mature capital market to develop onshore in the, in the euro area related, uh, linked to the euro. And this would have meant, in my view, again, a, a much more integrated regulatory framework in terms of uh, you know, uh, uh, maximum harmonization probably, more than, uh, than MIFID has been able to deliver. But also, I think that's crucial, uh, uh, more ambition in terms of giving a role to ESMA in terms of this process. We have seen that several national capitals have been very reluctant to let uh, ESMA uh, take a greater role. We've seen this here recently in the reform, in the discussion on the reform of the European supervisor authorities. And I think you cannot have a capital market union if there is no authority which is uh, responsible for it, which is uh, running with the project, which is uh, you know mm -hmm. accountable for delivering on that project. And uh, uh, and uh, so I, I th I'm afraid that uh, we will not achieve as much as we could in that area, at least at this juncture. But I know the colleagues in Paris are doing their best to address <laughs> the issues that uh, that you raise. Andrea, I, I, I think we have got to finish. But if you allow, there is someone that is yeah, really yeah, desperate. Yeah, I also think that uh, <laughs> uh, he has been asking for the call for a yeah, while, so yeah, let's yeah. take it. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Andre, and I'm from Credit Agricola, Strategic Planning Department. So talking now about our generation, our future as society, uh, how is addressing how is the ECB addressing climate action and the ECG goals uh, as supervisor and as uh, monetary policymaker? Can we expect, uh, for instance, a uh, specific inter uh, interest rate from for uh, banks champions in sustainability or other? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, uh, th thanks for the question. Uh, it's a good close to our it conversation is. because he's mm. looking more to the future. It is. I saw in his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I, 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 I generally believe that uh, uh, green finance sustainability will become uh, uh, more important uh, also in the, in the uh, approach of the authorities, both the central banking side, uh, the, uh, uh, the supervision. There is this network on greening of the financial system which has been established. It's interesting because it was established at the margins of the, uh, of the G20 in which the US basically started exiting the Paris Agreement and it was uh, a clear, let's say, decision, deliberate decision of the central banking community for some reasons to maintain the focus of the public authorities on, uh, on, uh, on this issue. And the ECB participates actively in this, uh, in this network which has issued a very interesting report, if you want to look at it, I think in uh, mid-April. And Frank Elderson, who is sitting on our board, is, is the chair of this, uh, of this uh, network. Uh, the, uh, the ECB supervision has identified uh, uh, the sustainability risk as one of the key risks already for 2019. So as, as you maybe know, every year we try to, have, when we develop our work program, uh, we, we do a risk map. So we ask the supervisors in all the jurisdiction to give us their priorities in terms of risk. For the first year, there was a number of uh, supervisors that told us that uh, sustainability is an important area. So we started appearing uh, with a relatively high priority on our risk map. Uh, in my view, let's say that the, there are two points I would make uh, just uh, for, 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 your, for your consideration. I mean, the first one is that, uh, as I mentioned before, there is this issue of short-sightedness uh, in risk management that we have not really tackled. If you look at all the risk models that we have, they all have a one-year horizon, basically, you know, in terms of PDs, LGD estimations, and the like. But if you think about 
transition, about uh, environmental transition. I mean, the risks are not uh, something that you can quantify with a, with a 12 months horizon. You need to look ahead. You need to look 10, 15 years, no, and check whether the the, the, the laws you are making are actually to you know uh, uh, the collateral you are taking for a loan. I mean, uh, is uh, is something which has value uh, for the whole maturity uh, of, of your of your exposure. I mean, there are, for instance, in the in the Netherlands, there are very strict regulations on uh, uh, houses which have, um, how is it called, the amiant, I can't remember the... Uh, yes, uh, asbestos. Asbestos, asbestos. So basically, the, these, uh, these uh, will be, their value will go to zero, basically, in, uh, in I think, by 2030, no? So basically, if you accept as collateral these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, these houses with asbestos, basically, you will lose all your, your val the value of your collateral in, in, in 10 years, basically. So these type of things need to be factored in, and, uh, and I think that uh, this uh, imposes a shift. I, I very much believe also in stress testing, for instance, not the, the, the traditional stress testing that we do with the three year, year horizon, but looking at a longer time frame of what would be the shift from brown to green sectors and what could be the impact also for bank land. So these are the things that, that I see positively. A little bit of concern that I have is when I hear that the issue of sustainability is used uh, in, in terms of asking for supporting factor. I don't like supporting factor. I, I would at least argue that they should change the name because, I mean, I don't think supervision sh should support anything. I mean, we, we are not here to support this or that activity. No, we are here to make sure that the risks are properly factored in your processes in the, in the banks. So I think that if you distort the, the, risk, the risk assessment and the capital allocation, from a policy perspective, because you want to favor one sector vis-a-vis -vis the other, I think you don't do a good service in terms of uh, supporting sustainability and green finance. But if you do instead uh, good taxonomies of what is green, what is not green, good transparency, and good factoring in, uh, in the risk management of these, uh, of these elements, I think you can do a great service to the future communities and future generations. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It. I think uh, I don't know if you want to say something. No, I mean, ju just to I, I've done a, um, a brief summary on the on the on the diversity of issues that you all touched upon, which I, th I think it's very positive. I mean, we've, we've we've spoken about IRB models, fintechs, AML, governance, um, profitability, sustainability, business models. Um, um, corporate banking uh, and, and the matter of pro uh, proportionality, bureaucracy and reporting, um, use of, of technology in areas besides the, the I mean, the commercial one, um, sustainability, impact of Brexit, NPLs. I mean, I think we've touched upon, I think, almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very yeah. much to the audience. Yeah. Thank you very thank much you. to you. Thanks and uh, uh, I mean, I think this was really, uh, uh, really, I think all of them want to, to thank you very much. I think they recognize uh, what a privilege it was to stay for two hours in front of the head of su banking supervision in Europe, uh, in banking union at least, uh, in such an open and free and, uh, and uh, closed dialogue uh, and uh, on their behalf somehow. Uh, I would like really to thank you. Um, I, I was kind of <coughs> implying and joking that uh, you, as you came twice to Portugal uh, that you liked us, but definitely we like you and your style. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you.